Thank you very much. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure and it's a great honor to be able to introduce to you this evening uh, this year's recipient of the Donald Cohn Lectureship. Uh, it's a great honor and privilege for two reasons. One is that Donald Cohn is my mentor, a colleague, and good friend. And the other is that the uh, recipient is also, at times, a friend. Uh, <laughs> Tony uh, Lang uh, is an internationally renowned neurologist. He is a stupendous clinician and has uh, been prodigiously productive in terms of contributions to the literature on Parkinson's disease. He did his initial uh, training in Toronto, which is a center on the small village on the 401, and uh, then went to King's College Hospital in London, England, then returned to Toronto and in uh, 1982 formed the Movement Disorders Clinic. He's the director of the Gloria and Morton Shulman Movement Disorder Center at the Toronto, uh, I guess it's the University Health Network, is it? Something like that. He's the head of neurology at University of Toronto. Uh, he is currently the president of the Movement Disorders Society, and he is the former editor-in-chief of the Movement Disorders Journal. He has made major contributions in many areas of uh, clinical neuroscience, particularly related to Parkinson's disease. And I have to say, one of the things that has always impressed me about Tony, apart from his uh, voracious appetite for work, is uh, his tremendous insight, although he is not a basic scientist by training, I've had many occasions over the years to uh, see his very thoughtful analysis of emerging literature, and he always provides uh, enormous insights. So with no further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce him to you. Thank you, John, for those kind words, and uh, good evening, everyone. It's a real pleasure to have been asked to speak to you, and it's a tremendous honor to have been given the, uh, the award this, this year. Uh, there's a list of outstanding clinical and uh, basic scientists that have won this award in the past, and uh, it, it really is a pleasure to, uh, to stand in their, uh, their shoes and to follow along. Um, I'm going to try to be a little controversial and difficult the, this afternoon. Um, I hope that I'll entertain a little bit as well in the process and uh, maybe encourage uh, people to, to think a little bit differently about uh, Parkinson's disease in the process. Now let's see if we can get this up. All right, well, um, what I thought I would do is adapt a lecture that I gave at the American Academy of Neurology this year that was entitled Parkinson's Disease Beyond the Decade of the Brain. And the decade of the brain was designated by Ronald Reagan in 1991, I believe, or 1990. Um, and uh, I thought what I would do is try to review some of the things that have happened in the field of Parkinson's disease since the end of the decade of the brain and try to show you how our field is moving and particularly try to emphasize some of the controversies that exist in our field. Uh, we were all very interested in hearing some of the um, important uh, Canadian contributions and uh, work that's going on in some of the Canadian research labs. Uh, today, and so I'm going to challenge some of the basic scientists. I'm going to try to emphasize uh, where the work that they're doing uh, is going to play an important role, and so uh, let's get on with things. So this is the beyond the decade of the brain, and actually it's kind of strange that I've got that there. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk about the changing concepts. And I'm going to acknowledge something that, uh, a term that some of you may be familiar with, the elephants in the room. I'm going to try to indicate to you where there are some pretty obvious concerns that maybe we've tried to ignore. The, uh, this is a, a term, I believe, that came from American politics in the 1900s. Uh, 
And I think there are a number of elephants in the room that uh, exist in Parkinson's disease that we kind of pretend aren't there and sort of there's this elephant in the middle of our cocktail party. We, everybody sees it, but you don't really want to talk about it or admit that it's really there. And I'm also going to talk about other elephants. So you're going to wonder, what the heck is this guy referring to with elephants and Parkinson's? So I'm going to talk about something that we've seen recently emphasized in Parkinson's, the elephant and the blind man. I'm going to refer to the elephant in the room. I'm going to finish with an elephant's and a different perspective on Parkinson's disease, and you could claim that this lecture is uh, studded with a gratuitous use of elephants. So this is me, my nightmare. What am I doing here? I can't play this thing. I'm a flautist for crying out loud. Well, I'm a clinician. I'm not a basic scientist, but I'm going to be criticizing some of both clinical and basic scientists, science in the process. And we're going to talk about changing concepts with respect to the definition of the disease, talk about etiology, the cause, the pathology, what the pathologist looks at in the brain of patients with Parkinson's, and the nature of the, uh, the development of the disease in the brain the clinical features, and then we're going to talk about therapeutics. Now, I'm going to deal with a number of conventional wisdoms and trying to poke holes at some of the conventional wisdoms. One of them is that Parkinson's disease is a neurodegenerative disorder due to loss of dopaminergic neurons in this black area of the brain that we all know about the substantia nigra compacta. Another wisdom is that this is a uniform, well-defined, clinical pathological state. The clinical features are well-defined. The pathology that's associated are well-defined. Another wisdom that we hear a lot of discussion about is that this toxin that has been so important to our field, MPTP, is a proof of an environmental etiology and that it also provides us an excellent model for human Parkinson's disease and it translates into outcomes in the treatment of various different human trials. So you might be surprised in knowing that we don't even have a definition for what Parkinson's disease is. And recent uh, information from science and, and neuropathology and some of the recent studies that I'm going to talk about have really shown us that we don't have a definition. Is this a clinical syndrome? Is it what the doctor sees when you come to the uh, movement disorder clinic and it might be associated with a response to levodopa, but these features are typically associated, the resting tremor, the slowness, the stiffness, with a particular uh, loss of nerve cells, a degeneration in that black area, the substantia nigra. Should we be defining it differently as not only a clinical syndrome, but associated with a very specific pathology that is seen under the microscope. And one of the hallmarks that we've known about for a very long time is the presence of these so-called inclusions uh, under the microscope, the so-called Lewy bodies or Levy bodies. Finally, you could even think about it as a specific pathological state, a degeneration in the brain with Levy bodies, but with a variety of clinical features, not just the tremor, the slowness, the stiffness, but a variety of clinical features. And I think one of the important uh, um, uh, bottom lines that I'm going to leave you with that I think we should be emphasizing now is that it's probably inappropriate to think of this as a uniform single disease. This is probably many diseases coming together presenting in the same way. And so one way that we're now thinking of Parkinson's disease is in fact Parkinson's diseases. And I think this is important to, to consider. Now, what about the cause? Well, this is a neat little picture that emphasizes the combination of various different causes, genes, environment, and maybe infectious agents and other cellular disturbances. So it's probably a mixture of various different things. And what are the clues that we might be dealing with? Well, one of the most important developments in this field that's come along in the last uh, decade is a recognition that uh, this condition can be inherited and that there are a small number of uh, gene mutations or genetic abnormalities that are sufficient to cause Parkinson's disease all by themselves. And we talk about this as monogenetic, a single gene associated with Parkinson's. And we're now down in this slide to 13 different variants. Uh, the colored ones, the pink and the, um, the blue, represent those that are best defined and um, we know that Parkinson's, by these various different genetic disturbances, may be inherited in a dominant fashion from uh, uh, generation to generation or in a recessive fashion where you need two genes combined to cause the disorder. 
But even then, this, this is the concept of a single gene causing the disease, even the old Mendelian thought, you remember Mendel being the, the monk that taught us about genes in, in uh, peas, uh, the old Mendelian concepts of genetics are changing and we're now recognizing that it may be enough just to inherit one of the recessive genes that could predispose you. May not be enough by itself, but could predispose you to develop Parkinson's. So this uh, genetic uh, picture is, is changing and has taught us a great deal about the disease. We know from a variety of so-called epidemiological studies then that there are predisposing or causative factors, genetics. We don't know the genetic contribution to uh, what we call sporadic Parkinson's when there isn't a family history and when we haven't found an obvious genetic role. We don't know of the role of these uh, recessive genes all by themselves or normal variation in genes may be sufficient in some cases to predispose. And one of the common um, uh, suggestions or hypotheses as to the cause of Parkinson's is, is that it's a combination of gene and environment. This is a very common, every time you hear a lecture about the cause of Parkinson's, you'll hear about that. And yet we still don't have any proof of a specific gene combined with an environmental exposure that has actually caused Parkinson's in a reasonable number of patients. What we do know is that age plays a very important role, that the disease is more common in men, that there is some predisposition given certain exposures, for example, farming with pesticides and herbicides, and there are probably many others that we don't know about. It's also interesting to know when studying cause that protective factors are understood, or at least recognized, they're not understood, and this is the one area where smoking may be uh, good for you, um, you all probably know that there is a lower incidence of smoking in people that have developed Parkinson's disease and the proposal that this may have some protective effect and yet on the other hand it may be a, um, a personality trait and the tendency to take up smoking and take risk uh, in your behavior less frequently rather than that smoking really um, protects. But there's also a negative association with caffeine Interestingly, uric acid, the, uh, the thing that causes gout, seems to have a role to play. And estrogen, we heard some discussion today about a potential protective role of estrogen. And it's also logical that we may find certain genetic factors that also protect against the development of Parkinson's. So we're, we've got a lot of question marks on this slide, and unfortunately we need, to, we need to see a lot more development in this field. But this is a slide that just shows you how age is probably the one most important uh, predisposing factor to developing Parkinson's disease, the mo most reliable factor that the disease does increase in incidence with age. Now what about, what about the pathology? This is uh, something that we thought was hammered down. We thought that there were characteristic features that could be seen under the microscope. But there are a lot of questions and, and controversy in this field too. You remember I mentioned, and I'll show you a picture of the inclusion body that we've always thought was characteristic of, of Parkinson's, the Lewy uh, body, as well as uh, the deposition of protein in, um, in neurites, so the so-called Lewy neurites. The role of the Lewy body and the role of the protein that uh, is so important to the development of the Lewy body, the distribution of the pathology and the progression and spread are all areas of uh, interest and uh, considerable change in our understanding of the condition. This is the old picture of the Lewy body. This is a stain that brings out this nice pink central core and the pale halo that surrounds this and we know that the halo on electron microscopy is made up of these so-called radiating uh, fibrils. We know that the uh, center of the core is uh, uh, stained very strongly for something called ubiquitin and the important protein that was discovered with the uh, first genetic abnormality that was defined for Parkinson's alpha synuclein we know that that is largely present in this halo so we know we know a lot about what uh, uh, the con uh, constituents of uh, Lewy bodies are but we still don't understand how they form or their importance the question also becomes with recent development is how important they are and this is pathology of four individuals in the same family. I know that Zig Zolik is one of the previous 
Donald Kahn lectures, and uh, with good reason, some of the contributions he's made have been very important, particularly to our understanding of the genetics of Parkinson's. And he was instrumental in finding the gene, the so-called LRRK2 or LARC2 gene that accounts for some patients and probably is the commonest gene that we know about that causes Parkinsonism uh, or Parkinson's disease nowadays. And in one family with one particular mutation, four different individuals had different pathologies. So you would have thought, gee, it's a genetic disorder. They all come down with Parkinson's. They must have the same gene when you, or the same pathology and the same disease when you look at it under the microscope. But in fact, some of them have this typical Lewy body formation. Others had so-called cortical Lewy bodies, Lewy bodies in the cerebral cortex. Often this is associated with a more cognitive uh, disturbance presentation. There were others, and this has also been shown in other mutations for LARC2 now, others that have uh, what are called neurofibrillary tangles with a different protein, so-called the, the protein tau. And this is a uh, disturbance that's much more common in another Parkinsonian disorder, progressive supranuclear palsy, that many of you have heard of. And so the pathology in some patients looks more like progressive supranuclear palsy than typical Parkinson's. And then still in others, this pathology was the first described with this uh, eighth form of par genetic Parkinson's, PARC8. We saw here just loss of the, um, the pigment of the cells, degeneration and loss of the uh, dopaminergic cells, but no inclusions, no abnormal protein uh, present in these cells, so a so-called bland degeneration. So we have to start asking ourselves how important, if you can get the same disease due to the same genetic mutation, all with different pathologies, how really important is it to have these Lewy bodies? It used to be thought these Lewy bodies were so critical to the development of the disease, but now we have to even question that. So there are controversies. Are Lewy bodies harmful? We know that these are accumulations, or so-called aggregations, glopping up of protein, and is it possible that this aggregation of protein interferes with normal cell function and somehow kills off the cells? That was a common hypothesis. Alternatively, it's possible that the presence of these inclusions in the aggregation of the protein is somehow a method of the cell walling off the abnormal protein and getting rid of it and successfully protecting itself. It isolates the abnormal protein and allows its normal function to continue despite the accumulation. Could it be an indication that the cell has somehow failed its methods of preserving itself? It's now on its way out and it's now allowed the protein to accumulate or is it possible that this is just an incidental finding and has nothing to do with the underlying cell loss? We just don't know. Another important uh, thing that we've known about for a long time, but I'm going to emphasize repeatedly throughout the remainder of the talk, is that we now know that Parkinson's disease is not just a disease in one area of the brain. This is a uh, little picture that uh, Andres Lozano and myself put together for a review paper several years ago. And here is the Substantia nigra projecting a dopamine path to the basal ganglia, this red mark here, and that's the dopamine disturbance. But we know that, yes, you have substantia nigra loss with dopamine, but you also have loss of other dopamine areas. For example, this region that's uh, over to the midline, causing uh, uh, related to the so-called ventral tegmental area that projects to a variety of areas, including this region called the uh, amygdala. We also know that Parkinson's disease is associated with loss of noradrenergic or uh, noradrenaline uh, uh, cells. These are located a little bit further down in the brain stem in a region called the locus ceruleus, and these project quite widely throughout the brain uh, with noradrenaline. We know that Parkinson's affects cells that use serotonin, another neurotransmitter, still further down in the brain stem, the so-called raphe nuclei. And this is also potentially important to a variety of uh, symptoms in Parkinson's, possibly including depression. We also know that other regions, for example, the acetylcholine region in the area called the substantia nominata, and other areas, the olfactory bulb, the amygdala, and a whole slew of other regions are also affected by the degenerative disease of Parkinson's. So this is not just dopamine cell loss in the nigra, this is a disease that affects many regions, and we have to take these regions into account when we see patients and try to understand the degenerative uh, disease. 
Another very interesting area that has uh, been discussed quite widely in our field over the last few years since the, area of the, uh, since the era of the decade of the brain was completed is this concept that was introduced by a man by the name of Heiko Brach, who is a neuroanatomist who studies many different brains brought to a brain bank. And he's evaluated patients, many of whom don't have the clinical features of Parkinson's. And he stained the brains for this protein that we know is so important to Parkinson's, alpha-synuclein. And he claims, and many neuropathologists now agree with this, this isn't universal, it doesn't apply to all brains of patients with Parkinson's, but it is widely applicable, that the disease probably doesn't begin in the substantia nigra compacta, which is in this region up here. It begins in the lower brain stem, as well as this area called the olfactory bulb that's so important to the sense of smell. And then when it affects the brain stem, it seems to somehow spread northwards. It spreads upwards as the disease progresses to involve the substantia nigra compacta, not at the first stages of the disease, but in what Brack refers to as stage three of pathological Parkinson's disease. So in fact, dopamine disturbances are not an early manifestation of Parkinson's. There are later disturbance of Parkinson's. And if we're gonna hit this disease in its earliest stages, we're probably talking about the dopamine far too late. I think we have to hit it a lot sooner when we're seeing patients and, and individuals who have the disease already beginning lower down. So I've made an analogy on a couple of occasions uh, uh, with Parkinson's disease to the Ptolemaic view of the universe. And you're all familiar with the Ptolemaic view where the Earth was the center of the universe. It was surrounded by all the planets as well as the sun. Solius was here in this um, uh, so-called geocentric concept of the universe. And I think that we've been dealing with a dopamaic view of Parkinson's disease where everything surrounds dopamine and all our concepts of neurorestoration, neuroprotection, neurotoxicity, symptomatic therapy, the cause or pathogenesis and all the clinical features have all related to this so very important but maybe given too much importance, neurotransmitter dopamine. And so I'm really trying to emphasize to you that we need to get beyond this concept uh, that uh, you could think of as a do dopamaic view. And in fact, we now recognize that Parkinson's disease and Lewy body disease, if we think of it that way, and I've already shown you reasons to maybe think that it's not quite uh, exclusively Lewy body disease, we know that many different manifestations can occur with the pathology of Lewy body disease. Patients may die without any symptoms at all. In addition to having Parkinsonism, they may have only tremor, dystonia, troubles with bowel, blood pressure, bladder function, disturbances of bowel function, as I've mentioned. Sleep disorders have become very important in our field. The recognition of so-called REM behavior disorder, acting out your dreams. Years before patients present with the features of Parkinson's disease. Excessive sleepiness, years before the development of the manifestations of Parkinson's. Cognitive disturbances, disturbances of, um, of appetite, smell, sensory abnormalities, and psychiatric disturbances all may be a manifestation of this same pathology. Again, many of these have nothing to do with dopamine. So I think that uh, the idea of Parkinson's disease being an elephant now is uh, I'm going to explain. And this is an idea that a man by the name of Bill Langston that some of you are aware of has uh, emphasized to us with the, um, the story of the blind men and the elephant. And so the blind men all examining an elephant from different perspectives, all coming away thinking that what they're examining is a very different thing. And so their idea included tree trunks, a rope, a snake, a spear, a fan, depending on what part of the elephant they examined. And this same idea, Langston and others have emphasized to us, depends on which physician happens to see you early on. If you happen to be a sleep specialist, you see Parkinson's from that perspective. A psychiatrist seeing patients with cognitive and, and psychiatric disturbances. An ear, nose, and throat specialist may see people when they complain of loss of a sense of smell. Uh, a GI, gastroenterologist, seeing patients for constipation, et cetera, et cetera. So Parkinson's is not just a single entity. We have to look at it as a, uh, a holistic, complex disorder, and we have to take our, our uh, blindfolds off to try to understand this more carefully. 
And one of the features that has really been emphasized in our field, and this comes from things that I've already told you, the BRAC idea, for example, is that we have Parkinson's that is premotor. In fact, some people have used the term preclinical. I think the idea is best to think of early non-motor or premotor symptoms. And there's strong evidence that constipation, loss of the sense of smell, certain sleep abnormalities, and depression are very common features well before patients present with the obvious tremor and slowness that I might see coming to my clinic. And in fact, there have been a number of very interesting studies, and some of them have come from this excellent uh, uh, opportunity provided by the Honolulu Asia, uh, Aging Study, where uh, aging male, Honolulu males, uh, Asians from Honolulu, uh, agreed to brain donation. They were examined and followed. These were all normal individuals, were followed uh, for many years until death and they were assessed for a variety of things. And I'm going to show you two things that they were uh, assessed for. The first was the sense of smell. And interestingly, the people that had the worst sense of smell, let's just look at this part of the diagram. The black bars, these were people who had the worst sense of smell. They divided them into what are called uh, quartiles or tertile, tertiles here. And you see the people with the worst sense of smell, when their brains were assessed at death, even when they didn't have Parkinson's disease in life, had 11 times the chance of having Lewy body pathology than those that had normal sense of smell. So that really does link this to Parkinson's. And in fact, we now know that we can evaluate sense of smell and the function of the olfactory tract with a variety of different methods. And this is a nice study using magnetic resonance spectroscopy or magnetic resonance imaging from Austria. From the same study, they looked at constipation. They've also looked at sleepiness, too, but this, these two I'm just showing you. And interestingly, those men that had fewer bowel movements, less than one bowel movement per day, had a much higher incidence of these Lewy bodies in their brain. Remember, these people didn't die with Parkinson's disease. These people were found to have Lewy bodies in their brain, and this was associated with a lower incidence of uh, bowel movements or more constipation, suggesting that the autonomic nervous system that supplies our bowels is affected very early on before you may develop features of Parkinson's. And indeed, a very interesting study looked at individuals who needed bowel and prostate surgery. This was a study from Spain where they took individuals who had to have uh, colon resections for tumors, prostate operations for various different causes, and I won't explain all the details. Everything that's brown here is stained for that protein alpha-synuclein that, remember, is so important to Parkinson's and is found in the Lewy body. And in fact, we find alpha-synuclein staining in nerve processes in the bowels of people who have had these resections. And this, this group is now following individuals and has some preliminary evidence that people who happen by coincidence to have alpha-synuclein staining in the prostate or in the bowel are beginning to show features that might be the earliest manifestations of Parkinson's. This is important and a great deal of hope if we're ever uh, hoping to be able to develop ways of screening individuals who might in the future develop Parkinson's when we have neuroprotective therapy that could slow the progression of the disease. Another really interesting area is the heart. And we know that Parkinson's disease, although it's very rare for people to have heart symptomatology, we know that the nerves that supply the heart muscle uh, contain alpha-synuclein and degenerate. This is a normal scan using this MIBG. This is a spec scan looking at a compound that uh, stains or, or um, uh, marks the, the, um, the connections, the uh, catecholamine connections in the heart. And you see here in Parkinson's disease, we don't have the normal cardiac outline indicating that these uh, myocardial nerve cells or nerve connections uh, are altered in Parkinson's disease. And this is, uh, may be seen very early on. It's more often seen later, but it, it can be seen early. I'm now going to move to therapeutics or treatments, and I'm going to discuss this in three general areas. Neuroprotection or the ability to modify the disease, change its course, the ability to delay motor complications and treat uh, symptoms of Parkinson's and surgical therapies. Now we've been searching for neuroprotection for a long time and the analogy has always been the holy grail. 
Uh, we really would love to find the holy grail of Parkinson's disease. I've commented that this might be Ira Schulson. This, this looks like Ira Schulson's mustache, uh, for those of you that know him, but uh, I can't tell with that helmet on. And you may unfortunately be aware that there have been a number of large studies attempting to show that drugs are neuroprotective or slow the progression, and so far we've run up against a brick wall. So that holy grail remains unattainable. And I've just listed some of these. The most recent is this agent that uh, we hoped would have a significant effect. It's what's called a mixed lineage kinase inhibitor, and it blocks the normal methods of cells uh, 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 taking their lives, uh, the ability of cells to kill themselves, or program cell death, apoptosis, we believe may be very important to the uh, neurodegeneration in Parkinson's, and unfortunately this too was ineffective. Now, why is it that these treatments have been ineffective? What are the outstanding questions? And we could spend a whole hour on these. I'm just listing these for your reading. I'm not going to discuss them at all. Uh, but you can imagine that there might be problems with any of them, that the trial design was inappropriate, that the cell death is beyond rescue, the dopaminergic cells can't be rescued. Maybe they're rescued, but they can't return to normal function. Maybe these cell death pathways, the uh, pathways whereby the cells are dying, are redundant and we block one area and there are other ways of getting around it. Maybe we're just not blocking the right uh, pathways or maybe, as I've emphasized already, uh, we're dealing with many diseases, not a single uh, disease with multiple pathways. This is some of the what call, what's called preclinical work that justified our study of this uh, mixed lineage kinase inhibitor, CEP1347. And you see here, these are animals, these are monkeys, treated with uh, MPTP and CEP1347 compared to animals that were given a vehicle or a control. And you see everything that's brown are the dopamine cells, and you see the tremendous loss of dopamine cells that was saved or protected when this agent was given. So this was very promising, and this is the same kind of work that's been done uh, outlining or predicting uh, the results of all of those earlier neuroprotective trials. And this is why we've always gone on to the neuroprotective trials, because these agents have been able to block the effects in the MPTP primate. So I'd emphasize that in addition to these ideas that we've uh, raised already, I think one of the problems that all of us acknowledge is that the animal models that we have for Parkinson's disease are completely inadequate. They're com not helping us predict uh, which treatments are going to slow the progression. They're inadequate or inappropriate, and this is a real challenge to our basic scientists to find better animal models, and certainly many of the Canadians that we're speaking today are searching for these. So I've tried to deal so far with these conventional wisdoms, that Parkinson's is a neurodegenerative disorder just due to loss of dopaminergic neurons. We know that that's not the case. It's not a uniform, well-defined clinical pathological state, and we now know that this isn't just an environmental disorder. MPTP didn't predict that, predict that. and unfortunately, although it is a great uh, toxin for certain uh, use, unfortunately it doesn't translate into the treatments that we hoped it would. So these are the topics I've dealt with so far. I'm going to finish talking a little bit about symptomatic therapy and neurorestoration. And here's where I'm going to introduce the concept of the elephant in the room. Remember, the thing that we're trying to ignore. We all know that it's there, but we're just not talking about it. Well, I beg your pardon, when I, where I come from, it's considered a compliment to let fly with a good trumpeting after dinner. Well, uh, this kind of elephant is a little hard to ignore. Uh, this elephant in the room we should all uh, acknowledge. But uh, maybe the, uh, the elephants that we've been ignoring are a little more subtle, but maybe not. So what conventional wisdoms are we dealing with in therapy? Well, levodopa, the most potent therapy, should be delayed. Could it be neurotoxic? Does it lose its effects, its clinical benefit with time? It causes motor complications. So these are the reasons that levodopa is delayed. And we know that dopamine agonists might be preferentially used because they delay the complications of levodopa. This is very important in terms of therapeutic concepts now that many neurologists apply in their day-to-day -day practice. Well, there's some problems with this. The first is that we know levodopa is a very effective drug, and this is a trial that we termed the early versus late 
DOPA and Parkinson's disease. These were all early untreated patients that were then treated with three different doses of levodopa compared to placebo. Interestingly, despite the fact that levodopa has been available uh, for many years, several decades indeed, this is the first dose response in a double-blind fashion that's ever been done with levodopa. Not surprisingly, we see that levodopa is quite effective. What's particularly interesting is what happened when these patients had levodopa withdrawn nine months after exposure. And importantly, these patients, given levodopa, especially the highest dose, did not return after two weeks to the same severity of clinical features of Parkinson's as would have been predicted in those patients who didn't receive levodopa. So this suggests that levodopa, in fact, is not bad for you clinically, at least in this short-term withdrawal, and there's some reason to believe maybe it's even neuroprotective. So this idea that neuro levodopa actually causes toxicity has to be questioned given this kind of information. However, levodopa causes complications. So even if you don't believe that it's toxic or bad for you, we're always still worried about it because we know that it causes a variety of movement complications, particularly levodopa-induced dyskinesias. And this is work from Ali Rajput from Saskatoon. I've reversed his slides so that you might understand it a little bit better. This is the cumulative development of abnormal involuntary movements or dyskinesias over time of exposure to levodopa, wearing off so-called end-of-dose loss of benefit. You get closer to the next dose and you begin to notice your tremor and your slowest, slowness coming out. And this is the more unpredictable variability or on-off. And so we know over time these are almost sometimes inevitable complications of levodopa uh, increasingly uh, with exposure. And we know from a variety of studies that if we use a dopamine agonist, and it doesn't seem to matter which dopamine agonist you use, in comparison to early levodopa, you can actually de uh, delay the development of these, especially the dyskinesias. So there's been a tremendous push to use drugs like rapinerol, pergolide, cabergoline, or pramipexol, because you see here, if we just use this slide, this is the development of dyskinesias with levodopa, the development of dyskinesias with rapinerol. So you see patients develop dyskinesias faster with the levodopa exposure compared to rapinerol. All of these uh, graphs are showing basically the same thing. They're uh, shown reverse uh, in some cases. You know, sometimes I enjoy this herd mentality. And unfortunately, that's what's happened in neurology. There's a bit of a herd mentality that we've developed in the use of dopamine agonists. Uh, this has been a knee-jerk response. You have somebody with early untreated Parkinson's, you've seen all of these figures, you know that levodopa causes motor complications, you start the dopamine agonist. Well, let's just look at the natural experience with levodopa. And this is an important study from the Mayo Clinic that looked at the probability of remaining free of dyskinesias. Well, very much like Ali Rajput's data, gradually everybody or a very high proportion of patients develop dyskinesias over time. We've known that for a long time. But what they then did was look at the proportion of patients who required medication adjustments because of these abnormal movements. And we're now seeing many fewer patients need drug changes. So yes, they develop dyskinesias, but often they're not that bothersome or disabling. And let's look at the proportion that had dyskinesias that were resistant to the medication adjustments, and this is in fact even less common. Then we look at what's called the Sydney multicenter study that prospectively followed patients over a period of 15 years, a very important study that found a very high proportion of patients that survived had dyskinesias or wearing off, end of dose failure. 15 years, this is common garden variety Parkinson's disease. However, these problems were not disabling in the majority of individuals. These were not the major sources of their problems. I'm going to share you very briefly a little study, a clinical study that uh, we're just finishing off writing, uh, where we ask patients. It, uh, physicians are very paternalistic, as you know, but I think things are changing, and we are listening to our patients a little more often nowadays. And so one of the things that struck me was that no one has really asked patients what they think of having dyskinesias. And some of you in the, in the audience do have dyskinesias, and some are bothered, and some maybe less so. So we actually asked 52 patients who had never been treated, 
102 people who were on treatment but hadn't developed dyskinesias as yet, and 105 who had already developed dyskinesias. We asked them a series of questions, and I'm going to show you two kinds of questions that we asked. The first was, how concerned were they about dyskinesias, the idea of dyskinesias? We defined them for those that never had them. We characterized these in a very formal, uniform way, and then we asked, what is your concern now that you know uh, the, the, uh, what dyskinesias are and how they develop? And not surprisingly, people who hadn't been treated were very concerned about this. They've seen Michael J. Fox on television. They're very worried about the development, and they will allow that very commonly, as I'll show you in the next slide, to influence how they want us to treat them first off. The people who have now had the benefit of, of medication and they're now experiencing improvement, they know more about Parkinson's disease, they're less concerned. Once you've got dyskinesias and you've, you realize what these are, they're not the end of the world and in fact you're benefiting when you have dyskinesias and your Parkinsonism is a lot less at the times you have dyskinesias, very, very different pattern. Either not concerned or only mildly concerned in a very high proportion. And so the idea of this herd mentality, write a prescription based on what you think is best for your patient, maybe we need to listen to our patients a little bit more, especially those that have already had this experience. We also ask them, are you more concerned about having dyskinesias or having Parkinson's features? And if you hadn't been treated, you were roughly equally concerned. You knew you had Parkinson's, you wanted good treatment for it, but you were also very concerned about having dyskinesias. It didn't change very much in patients who hadn't developed the dyskinesias already, but not surprisingly, and I think most Parkinson's cl clinicians have known this for a very long time, but it's never been formally studied. When you ask somebody with dyskinesias, are you more concerned about having Parkinson's or your involuntary movements, they hate the Parkinson's and would much prefer having dyskinesias at a cost of, uh, uh, or the benefit at least, of getting rid of or improving the Parkinsonism. So, we do know, on the other hand, that we can delay these dyskinesias, and we do know that in some patients the dyskinesias are indeed disabling. So I'm not trying to pretend they're not an important issue, and I'd love to prevent them and, not to, and to be able to treat them more effectively. However, it's unclear in delaying these dyskinesias in those early slides, we haven't had follow-up beyond five years in those studies. So we don't know what the long-term advantages are of delaying dyskinesias. We know that once you start levodopa in every one of those studies, having been on the dopamine agonist doesn't protect you from developing dyskinesias. You get them just in the same way as you would have had you started levodopa. There's no protection. And we also know that the dopamine agonists are not as effective as levodopa. Patients clearly do better on levodopa. And we now recognize that dopamine agonists have a variety of complications. We've known about leg swelling and hallucinations. But in the last few years, we've become aware of a variety of other problems that, in fact, occupy my time tremendously and occupy the time of many of the clinicians in this room. Excessive daytime sleepiness, impulse control disorders. You've all heard of the troubles with gambling and shopping and eating, etc. And now, more recently, the change in heart valves with pergolide and another drug called cabergoline that isn't available in Canada. So starting these drugs is very complicated and takes a great deal of time. And so I think this herd mentality needs to change and we have to have a very open mind and a very careful review of what's best for an individual patient. So I think we have to think about what we smell when we're starting uh, treatment and we have to be aware of the fact that uh, maybe the, the marketing of uh, uh, the way to treat Parkinson's disease has influenced us a little inappropriately. So in conventional wisdoms related to these, let's move on to functional surgery. Lesioning, for example, thalamotomy and more recently pallidotomy uh, was really quite prevalent and uh, Andres Zizano and I cut our teeth together with pallidotomy, but you now know that this has uh, really given way to a whole new era of neuromodulation, neurorestoration, and potential neuro re neuroregeneration. And so I'm going to cover a couple of brief points in the concluding uh, slides, talking about the impact, the timing, and importantly, the need for randomized trials. Let's deal first with neuromodulation or deep brain stimulation. And this is the region that's particularly important to the common treatment of Parkinson's disease nowadays. We're hoping for 
potential benefit with other areas, but this is the area I'm going to talk about. And we know now that subthalamic nucleus deep brain stimulation is effective and in fact more effective than the best medical management. This is a study that came out of Germany, published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, last year, and you compare deep brain stimulation with these various methods of looking at the clinical examination and the involuntary movements compared to medical management. This is the percent improvement. It's hands over fists better than best medical management, and we now recognize that the quality of life in uh, various different scales is also improved with neurostimulation. However, um, following patients with neurostimulation is, is teaching us something too. If, if we look at the off medication scores, this is if you withdraw medication, we know that people five years, this is a study from the Grenoble group that was also published in the New England Journal a few years ago, the motor and activities of daily living scores off medication remain significantly improved. The levodopa induced dyskinesias remain significantly improved after five years. So that's really quite impressive and consistent. However, when we assess patients on medicines, the best they're going to be combining medication and stimulation, things are a little different. And if we compare what patients were like at baseline before surgery, now we're finding that the clinical state is in fact worse. The motor scores and the activities of daily living scores are worse, and this is especially explained by a failure to control things like walking, speech, and stability on the feet. In addition, we're also recognizing that these patients who prior to surgery were highly functional are beginning to show features that unfortunately we see without surgery. They're beginning to show cognitive disturbances and ap apathetic features, depression, other features that suggest that the disease is progressing beyond the substantia nigra in those areas that I've already emphasized. This is a very interesting study from Paris that's questioned when we should be initiating therapy. And uh, this is where uh, our group and uh, people that are doing surgery should have taken a page out of the epilepsy surgeon's uh, book. This is a study looking at social adjustment, small study of 29 patients, and they found that despite the fact that these patients were substantially improved, and I showed you the off-period motor scores, the dyskinesias, tremendous benefit, these patients really weren't that much better in social adjustment and in fact there were certain things, their ability to interact with their uh, caregiver, their spouse, and their ability to return to work were actually worse after surgery than before surgery. 19 of the 29 complained of a strange feeling, an unfamiliarity with themselves. They had difficulty adjusting to this new role of being so much better after deep brain stimulation. 17 of 24 had marital conflicts and three underwent divorce. This is probably the commonest cause of divorce in Parkinson's disease now, is the benefit that subthalamic nucleus deep brain stimulation provides and the difficulty that the spouse and the family have combined with the patient in dealing with this substantial improvement in their function. The patient wants to return to a normal life. They want to go back to work. They want to have interaction with their family. They want to have sex with their spouse. They want a normal in, uh, life and in fact they've been relegated to a state of invalidism because we've been doing the surgery very late in the disease. And 19 of, uh, 9 of 16 who were working before the surgery actually never returned to work. So a great response when I examine the patient but kind of disappointing response when you take this kind of story. So currently this procedure is a, a given to and advised for advanced disease. Usually studies that report results, the mean, the average duration of the disease is 14 years. Patients are retired and often dependent on others. So I think a very important question we have to ask ourselves now is when should we be providing the surgery? Should we not be providing it a little earlier, considerably earlier? When there's less medical, cognitive, and psychiatric problems, when the psychosocial burden of the disease is not established, and when quality of life and social participation remain high, when the person is still working and interacting with their family. And this is going to be a real challenge to our healthcare system because this means a lot more patients are going to require this procedure. On the other hand, I don't want to leave you with a belief that this isn't without problems, and there's some very interesting work 
this uh, treatment has a large number of side effects that I'm not going to go through, but it's also interesting to note that some interesting uh, research has now drawn our attention to the fact that subthalamic nucleus stimulation alters people's impulsivity and makes them more impulsive. They make certain decisions faster and more inappropriate without weighing the, uh, the various alternatives. They don't hold their horses carefully enough, uh, and this may compromise their daily function somewhat. Let's go on to the final issue of cell-based therapies. And there are a variety of them, cell-based, uh, growth factors, growth promoting factors, and gene therapies have actually been applied to Parkinson's disease. And I'm not going to go through the details, but just cover a couple of important points. This is the nigrostriatal pathway, the dopaminergic pathway from the substantia nigra to the putamen and the caudate. And this is the region that we know is so important to the movement features of Parkinson's. And this is where we see the transplantation of uh, fetal and potentially even in the future um, stem cell uh, therapies as we saw the loss of the dopamine cells. So that you saw the fade out of the dopamine cells and we will then replace this into the uh, area that the dopamine cells project to and result in the motor complication or motor problems of Parkinson's. And there's been a lot of hope for this treatment. Fetal transplants in this quote constitute a second chance for patients who no longer benefit from pharmacological therapy. Further trials of such therapy could pave the way for the development of other substituted cell-based therapies, you could read that stem cells, that may eventually prove to be effective treatment for all patients with advanced Parkinson's disease. I think and I hope that you've learned something this evening that might suggest that there are some problems with these, uh, these quotes. Another elephant in the room. The party had been going splendidly, and then Tantor saw the ivory keyboard. So again, I'd raise the point that we've got a very large elephant in this room related to cell-based therapies. Because here's the dopaminergic pathway, substantia nigra to the striatum. This is where we're going to implant our cells, at least where we're going to for a little while until we have better ways of making cells go in a variety of different regions of the brain that we don't have currently. However, number one, we have dopaminergic areas that are also degenerating, maybe a bit later than the nigra, and these project to a variety of different regions, including the cerebral cortex. In addition, we have to remember that this is just one area of the very large part of the pathology of Parkinson's disease. And you remember all of those regions that I've pointed out, many different neurotransmitters spreading from the bottom up, and so Parkinson's is not just a nigrostriatal dopamine deficiency, and so transplanting cells into this region is a rather uh, naive and limited way of managing Parkinson's disease. And in fact, emphasized by this study that I mentioned earlier that came out of Sydney a couple of years ago, the non-levodopa, the non-dopamine features of Parkinson's tend to predominate after people have had this disease for many years. So in this study, after 15 years, we saw features, neuropsychiatric, motor pre features that weren't responsive to levodopa, problems with blood pressure, bowel, et cetera, that weren't responsive to levodopa. And these really are some of the most important challenges to our treatment. In addition, some very interesting things come from the study of cell-based therapies that also emphasize how we need future uh, clinical trials to be carefully carried out. This is an interesting uh, evaluation of patients who participated in the fetal transplant trial that combined work from Denver and New York. And what they did was at 12 months, they asked patients compared to before surgery what they thought they had received and clinically evaluated these patients. So these patients were examined by doctors who didn't know what they received. These are clinical examinations. And they asked the patient what they felt they had received. And interestingly, if the patient thought they had received the sham, independent of whether they received a non-active or the active transplant, they actually did worse than if they thought they had the active transplant. So if patients feel that they have active treatment, even if it's the sham and more so if the transplant, they actually do better. So there is a tremendous potential in Parkinson's disease for a placebo response, and this if response is long-lasting. It lasted over 12 months, and these were clinical examinations. These weren't assessments of how do you feel you're doing. 
This was the doctor examining the patient for tremor, rigidity, postural stability, and saying they actually did better. So I'm going to conclude emphasizing that maybe we now need novel perspectives in the understanding of the pathogenesis and management of Parkinson's disease, and I'm going to bring you to the elephant again. And my analogy might be looking at Parkinson's through the eyes of a child. Remember Parkinson's through the non-eyes, the, the non-seeing eyes of the blind men giving us a very different perspective of what this condition is that really isn't close to reality. So another analogy would be, could, should we be thinking of Parkinson's as a hat? And some of you may recognize this picture. This is a picture from saint exupris beautiful novel, The Little Prince. And my analogy is that maybe we need to look at Parkinson's disease with a very novel perspective, uh, throw away old concepts, and really, hopefully, with the scientists that we're presenting today, start to really break through with novel new ideas and realize that maybe it's not quite the hat, maybe it's the old elephant. Remember, this is the story where the little prince realized that the drawing was, in fact, not a hat. It was an elephant that had been consumed by a snake. So I've talked to you about a variety of different aspects of Parkinson's from definition through therapeutics. I've tried to emphasize to you that one new concept that we've had over the last decade is that this may not be a single disorder, it may be several. I've tried to emphasize that we need to move away from what I've termed the dopamaic view of Parkinson's. This is much more than dopamine deficiency accounting for these problems. And I think that in the future, we're going to have to address what I think are the major unmet needs the next 20 years and hopefully shorter than that for all of our sake, mine in caring for patients, yours in dealing with the disease, is that we're going to move away. I think most of us believe fluctuations in dyskinesias fairly soon will hopefully be a thing of the past and we're really going to have to emphasize these other things, trying to change the progression, deal with the non-dopamine, non-motor features, and try to uh, change the uh, course of the disease. I've probably offended quite a few people here. Relax, Jerry, he probably didn't know that you were an elephant when he told that joke. So uh, I'm sure I've uh, bothered some people in some of the statements, maybe uh, confounded some, but uh, I hope I've challenged you a little bit and entertained you in the process, and thank you very much. I think we've got questions that are you want to do? There are a couple of microphones, I think, around. At least I was told there were. I guess I've solved the disease for you. It's a question here. I'm not in the science field. I'm just a, fa a family member. Uh, my father has Parkinson's disease. So um, my question to you is when you were talking about the genes, is there any way to know at my age, at this point, if there's any predisposition to some of the genes to, you know, maybe down the road or in a few years from now or to see if I'm predisposed to, um, to the disease myself. And it's an excellent question and one that everyone is asking now that we're recognizing uh, certain genetic forms. Um, genetic single gene, the, what, what I call the monogenetic forms, still are recognized as causing only minority of patients with Parkinson's disease. If there is not a family history or if the disease didn't begin at a very young age, we have a fairly low likelihood of finding a causative gene at this point. In families where we have uh, a clear uh, inheritance of the disease, then in fact we need good studies to find out what causes predisposition. Uh, we know, and I didn't talk about this at all, the commonest gene that causes Parkinson's is this, that LRRK2 gene. Uh, the commonest is a specific mutation in the gene, and we know that that doesn't cause, part, even if you have the gene, and the, the mutation, I should say, you only have about a third of the patients with the gene actually end up showing the disease. So there must be other factors that contribute to the way that that gene manifests itself. And ourselves and Dr. Stossel and a variety of others are in fact trying to find out 
what those factors might be that would predispose to the development of Parkinson's because people with those genes are going to be the first that will be receiving treatment that we might feel slows the progression or actually prevents the, uh, the development of the disease as new treatments become available. Um, you, hi. you mentioned uh, um, depression and you mentioned uh, placebo and I'm just wondering do you have any comment on whether there's a Parkinson's personality profile? So this, this is a very long-standing issue and uh, so with the development of many uh, features of Parkinson's that are pre-motor. In fact, there is good reason to think that maybe there is a personality that is more likely to be re related to that underlying, um, that underlying disease. Um, some people used to think it was a, a predisposing personality. Uh, I think it probably is more appropriate to think that maybe the disease is there and that then results in the personality that might include depression, might not. Um, and so, again, I've emphasized that it's likely that the disease is present for many, many years before you ever develop the overt clinical features. And that's why it's so important for the development of uh, early markers, what we call biomarkers of the disease. If we could predict who has it at a stage where all they've got is some constipation or loss of the sense of smell and they've never developed the other features, and if we then had a treatment that could slow the development of the disease or prevent it from coming out, Parkinson's disease could be a thing of the past. And that's certainly one of the hopes, that we'll be able to put these things together, a marker of who's going to develop it, whether it's having a gene or something else, and then a new treatment. And again, that's where hopefully the support of the Parkinson's Society and the scientists in the room will see earlier advances in this area. Yeah, generally it's a decline because the areas of the brain that have the cells that use those transmitters to communicate to other cells are, are degenerating too. And so there's varying different uh, losses. There may be some comp compensation and changes uh, in certain of these areas, but generally you see a, a gradual reduction in, in, in all of them. Dr. Lang, I, if I understand you correctly, you said that Parkinson's is turning out to be a much more complex disease than you had originally thought. Is, is this typical of neurological diseases or is, does this in some way set Parkinson's aside apart from the others? No, I think it is, is common. I think we're recognizing that this uh, probably it does exist in many other neurodegenerative diseases. Alzheimer's disease, certainly we're recognizing some forms of Alzheimer's are strongly inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion, but the majority of people don't have genetic predisposition. Again, age predisposes to Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or Lou Gehrig's disease, also a certain proportion have a genetic cause, but the majority don't. So I, I think this applies to many neurodegenerative diseases. Yes, sir. Thank you for an informative and interesting presentation. It was very enjoyable. Um, I had a question with respect to the uh, Australian study you, you had slide up, yeah. where it showed advancing symptoms over 15 years. I'm just wondering how such studies um, distinguish or control for typical aging, progressive of aging symptoms from Parkinson's. That's a great question, and you can't. Um, you can't separate out uh, exclusively the role of aging, and I think most of us believe the role of aging is quite critical in the development of some of these features that aren't responsive to, uh, to medication. But I think we also recognize, given that neuropathology, that we have to explain some and maybe a large part on the basis of the disease itself. But you're right, aging clearly does, normal aging and cell loss that we have with aging does clearly play a role. And we know that Parkinson's disease in an elderly individual can behave very differently from Parkinson's disease in a young individual. Now, we know that very young individuals more commonly have certain genetic causes, but if we separate those out and just take people we don't think have an obvious genetic cause, say beginning at the age of 45, their disease cha changes at a different rate, they develop uh, certain problems in a different fashion than the elderly patient with Parkinson's. So, speech difficulties, walking difficulties with postural instability tend to occur earlier and tend to be more resistant in the older individuals. So you're right, aging does probably play an important role. 
Dr. Lang. <clears throat> About five years ago, I couldn't speak, I couldn't sing, I couldn't play ping pong anymore, a number of other things like that. Since then, uh, I've been diagnosed for 10 years. Things have got better. I found my backhand again in playing ping pong. I, I, skating is an interesting phenomenon for me to, because my left leg wouldn't come along with the right one for a while. Is there a, a series of stories or of, of discussion of improvements that people have experienced, like I have experienced? Well, I think that one of the more critical questions is what happened to you in the interim in terms of management. And most of the time we find that the... Uh, And typically that's the case. I think that it's critical for us to recognize that the most important thing that ever happened to Parkinson's disease is the recognition of dopamine deficiency and the use of levodopa. And uh, it's remarkable how when that's used judiciously, sometimes with dopamine agonists in combination, people at 10 years into the disease can do remarkably well. And you may be totally unaware of any progression or changes in the disease because of the striking ability of this treatment to mask the symptoms of the disease. And so you've got a good doctor that knows what he's doing with a good patient who's compliant and going back to his back end and skating, and uh, so that's fantastic. Hi, doctor. I'm 65 years old. I have Parkinson's for 10 years. A year ago, I dropped off Mirapex, <clears throat> and since that time, <clears throat> I lost 41 pounds. I just lost my appetite. I lost 41 pounds. How would you explain that? So you, all you did was stop the Mirapex? I changed Mirapex to Amantazine, and I dropped 41 pounds in one year without doing any effort. Well, uh, one aspect of dopamine agonists that we now recognize is something called binge eating. And so some people eat inappropriately or more than they need to, and weight gain can be a problem in those individuals. Uh, swelling and, and retention of fluid can sometimes contribute a bit to the, uh, the weight gain, but typically not to a major extent, so it, it may simply be that. Uh, some people lose their appetite with other treatments, so uh, loss of appetite can be a feature of dopamine treatment, including levodopa, so maybe that's contributed a little bit too. But you look well and feel well then. Yes? Can we get the microphone? I've been Parkinsonian for some time now, and I, I find that I don't get any information from people. Like, I know you spoke tonight a number of things that I'm unfamiliar with, and uh, a number of things that I was familiar with, and I can't sort it all out and find out which, what's happening. I'd like to know somebody in the in the society or in the in the uh, uh, the the group of doctors the consortium or whatever they are uh, if they if they could make us more aware of the problems that we're facing uh, unknowingly and uh, um, and and just give us the 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 uh, the, the more and more information that we, we can get to, to fight this thing. Well, it's a it's very, very good point and well spoken. Um, I think that you, you raise a critical issue that uh, patients and families need information. Uh, this is a very complicated field, and so information is changing regularly. Uh, one of the points I tried to make was that a lot of things that we believed in before, we have to have significant question about. Um, all I can suggest is that you have a good neurologist who knows about Parkinson's disease and hopefully will take time to explain things to you. We're going to be talking tomorrow about some of the challenges that Parkinson's clinics have in dealing with patients with Parkinson's, and one of them is clearly the demand to see large numbers of patients with insufficient staff, with, uh, uh, we have to pay for our nurses out of our own research budgets, uh, a variety of challenges that uh, I think make it difficult to, to treat this complicated disease. Hopefully the information that the, the society gives you will provide some of this, support groups, etc. But there's no easy answer. It's a challenge. Yes.
I think it's both. I think there are uh, excellent international co uh, collaborations. Again, one of the reasons that the scientists are here uh, tonight is that uh, the Parkinson Society is encouraging Canadian collaboration, recognizing the importance of that. Um, I don't think you should under, underestimate the importance of competition too, though. And so uh, I think we have to recognize that when there's something at the, the gold ring at the end, and uh, we're all human beings, there, we all benefit from being patted on the back and being, uh, getting the grants and uh, uh, succeeding in what we do. Uh, and so I think that is very important for researchers uh, in, in their work. And, and uh, I think that as long as the competition is not the exclusive thing, and they're not competing to the detriment of advancing the science, and hopefully very few are, uh, then I think it's for the best. And I, I, there is a lot of international collaboration, too. As a matter of fact, Dr. Lang, this question goes in the direction that I, the question that I was going to ask. Um, I came across uh, a reference uh, a while ago about work underway in Russia, where they are trying to use magnetic fields or electric fields uh, to, uh, to as, as a treatment method. Uh, I was just wondering whether you heard about it or what's, uh, what you might want to comment on this. Whether there's well, there, there are a lot of similar kinds of claims from all over the world. Uh, generally, these are very poorly substantiated. I've already emphasized to you that there is a tremendous potential for a placebo res uh, response or effect, not only perceived by the patient, but perceived by the doctor who wants their treatment to work. And uh, I think we have to have tremendous skepticism until things are proven properly with appropriate clinical uh, trial design. And so far, none of those types of treatment have ever really been proven to be effective. And there have been many claims. I'd like to uh, thank Dr. Lang for a tremendously entertaining comprehensive and thought-provoking presentation, and you for your questions. Now, I have two more pleasant duties left to me before I suffer the fate uh, that uh, was extended to Don Giovanni in the final act. Um, the first is to present Dr. Lang with the uh, Donald Cohn Lectureship Award uh, Memento. Um, I think, I think this one is actually for me. <laughs> now, I, I have another duty. Uh, Dr. Lang served uh, for several years on the Scientific Advisory Board of the Parkinson Society, and uh, you all know that the monies that are raised for research uh, must be distributed after a fairly rigorous peer review process, and we take this very seriously. And uh, my job is to distribute grants for review, and I try to do this according to uh, expertise and to ensure that there is no obvious conflict of interest. And uh, sometimes we have people who are recognized experts on the particular topic of an application, and sometimes that's more difficult. And I have to uh, confess in public that uh, when I had the most difficult time finding uh, expertise, Dr. Lang would be the person who would receive the application because I knew that, uh, well, yeah, it's, <laughs> there were other reasons, but <laughs> Does I, the word jump come to mind? <laughs> I knew that uh, no matter how difficult the topic, no matter how challenging, that we could always count on having a very careful and insightful review. And uh, this is a very small memento of thanks from the Parkinson Society for your time on the SAB. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'm Joyce Gordon, and I'm President and CEO of Parkinson Society Canada. And it's not over yet, Tony, so I have a something else for you. Um, over the past five years, Parkinson Society Canada has contributed over $5 million to research. And uh, what I would say to you is, that's good, but it's not good enough. We need to do more 
And uh, we at Parkinson Society Canada, with our regional partners, have been working hard to strengthen our relationships with the research community and are developing strategies to raise more funds. And uh, to that end, uh, Tony talked about it earlier, we had a meeting today here in Ottawa with over 70 researchers and scientists. It was wonderful to hear the question about collaboration because collaboration was alive and well in that room. And uh, what we've also done is, uh, as an organization, are taking the time to uh, recognize and appreciate the work of researchers who many of us never see. They're at their benches and some of them tell us they have conversations with their lab rats and their monkeys and their chickens and they often don't uh, get out to get, uh, in our view, the kind of appreciation that they should have and they're doing wonderful work to find the cure and the cause of Parkinson's. So we held two appreciation events this year. One was in Ottawa and the other one was in Toronto and we work very closely with our regional partners, Parkinson Society Ottawa, Central Northern Ontario. And I'm pleased to say that today we have the three executive directors of Ontario here. I'd like them to stand up because I, I want you to know who they are. Denise Taylor Gillen, who's the executive director of Ottawa. <laughs> we have Debbie Davis, who's the executive director of Central and Northern Ontario. She's at the back by the door. And we also have Carolyn Connors from London, Ontario with the Southwestern region. Uh, these people and their staff, and there's the national staff here and there's staff from Parkinson Society Ottawa, staff work on behalf of people with Parkinson's and for the research community and for our donors and our volunteers and the public at large. But more importantly, we're here to um, honor the research community and to say that without our regions and our staff in the regions and the many, many, many volunteers who are here in this room, we could not do the work that we do. So it's, it's a thanks to you too. But that took me a long way to get to say, Tony, you're going to receive something that only um, nine other people in Canada have received and you're going to be the tenth. And the, uh, the deal with this is you get to come up and open this up, but you have to put it on because it's, it's one of those Kodak moments, you might say. And I don't think this will be a surprise to you because uh, some of his people uh, from the University Health Network also have some of these, but I'm not sure they might have worn them in your office, so maybe it's the first time for you. All right. So what this is, and Tony's going to model this for us, it's a very a designer, exclusively designed lab coat, and it says Team Parkinson's on it. And as I say, you are the 10th person in Canada to receive this and uh, it is very special because we are building the research team and our links to the research community and you're going to hear shortly and they're gonna, you're going to see who they are. There are a lot of researchers in the audience tonight. So, Tony, congratulations. We hope you will wear it with great pride. We know you will. I expect to come down and see the Movement Disorder Clinic and you wearing it. I'll forewarn you though so you can... <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you very much. Well, finally, I would like to thank all of you for being here. This event is really for you as well. Um, I would also like to thank again Solve very much for your generous support to make this event happen. I would like to... <laughs> to point out a few members of the audience. Um, we have two uh, past chairs of the Parkinson Society Canada amongst us, uh, Alan Riccardi and David Simmons. Please stand up. And Brian Fitzgerald, who is a current board member. Brian. You've also heard mention of this very um, impressive meeting taking place this weekend, which is the Parkinson's Disease Research Alliance meeting um, that has been organized uh, with scientists from across Canada to share in uh, the research advances and to create a little bit of uh, thought provocation. 
So I would ask that uh, the members of the audience who are the neuroscientists, the researchers associated with this meeting, please stand up so that we may honor you. You are now welcome to stay for refreshments and Dr. Lang will be here for a little while longer and you may have the opportunity to ask him a few more questions. Alors, merci à tous d'être venus. Restez pour un apéro et l'occasion peut-être de jaser un peu plus avec le Dr. Lang. Bonne soirée. <laughs>